Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Tonight, we're going to be reading out of Song of Solomon 8, 6, Love is Strong as Death. Oh, it moved again. I don't know why it does that. Okay, the whole verse says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Let's go and read this in con. This is actually really powerful. This is going to be a very powerful devotion tonight. Uh, let's see here. One, two, three, four, five. So we'll start in verse one. Longing for her beloved. Verse one. Oh, that you were like my brother, who nursed at my mother's breasts. Now, a lot of people read way too much into the Song of Solomon. She's talking about the closeness they have. Oh, that you were like my brother, that we were so close that we were like we were connected that way. Because birth siblings have a different connection than people who are super close friends. Who nursed at my mother's breast. If I could find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. I would lead you. That's talking about closeness too. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to instruct me. I would cause you to drink of spiced wine, of the juice of my pomegranate. Now, this is very weird speech. That It seemed like two people would talk to each other, but there's it's code. This is code, and it's a love letter from Christ to the church, from Christ to those that believe. Verse 3, his left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up love. Sorry, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. This is a very interesting statement here. A lot of this we don't understand. But when you come at this from a, a place of understanding, this is a communication from Jesus to us. You start to realize the intimacy with which the love he loves us with. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree. There, your mother brought you forth. There, she who bore you brought you forth. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Waters, or many waters, cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. And now he gives what's called final advice. That's kind of interesting. Let's read this. We have a little sister. And she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she is spoken for? Because uh, back then they looked, uh, it, it was an approving thing to, to be fully breasted because then you could, you know, it was a sign of fertility and you could nurse children, but the women who have those small mammary glands, they, they were looked at as somebody who couldn't. Not that they couldn't, but you understand what I mean here. So this is where this kind of speech comes from. If she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. So they're going to hide her away. What's interesting here is he's talking about Christians and believers and, and how they communicate with each other, how they provide for each other. And this is something that they're going to do for the one who can't provide. The, the breasts are a symbol of provision. We talked about this before on that other weird heresy people are coming up with. Verse 10, I am a wall and my breasts like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. How we go from breast to peace. That's weird. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring forth its fruit a thousand silver coins. My own vineyard, vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and those who tend its first or tend its fruit two hundred. You who dwell in the gardens, the companions listen to your voice. Let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or young stag on the mountain mountains of spices. Very poetic language. But it's something that seems weird for two people who are in love with each other to talk about. Well, the symbolism here is extremely deep. And I did a, a quick read through on this. I have a playlist on it. We didn't dig super deep into it. But there's so much here. When you look at these representations with which, with which they're using to refer to each other and the love they have for each other, 
elsewhere in the Bible, you start to see a very vivid picture being being portrayed uh, as to what this is really talking about. It's code. And only those who understand it, only those who the Lord has given it to to understand, will be able to figure this code out, namely us. Whose love can this be, which is as mighty as the conqueror of monarchs, the destroyer of the human race? And that would be death. So whose love is this that overcomes that? Would it not sound like satire if it were applied to my poor, weak, and scarcely living love to Jesus my Lord? I do love him, and perhaps by his grace, I could even die for him, which would be a, an incredible honor and privilege. But as for my love in itself, it can scarcely endure a scoffing jest. You, what are you acting like that for? You love Jesus like that? I know what this feels like from way back. Much less a cruel death. Surely it is my beloved's love which is here spoken of, the love of Jesus, the matchless lover of souls. His love was indeed stronger than the most terrible death, for it endured the trial of the cross triumphantly. Amen? It was a lingering death. He didn't die immediately. It took hours. People don't realize he was on that cross for hours, minimum six hours, alive. It was a lingering death, but love survived the torment. A shameful death, but love despised the shame. A penal death, but love bore our iniquities. A forsaken, lonely death from which the Eternal Father hid his face. But love endured the curse and glorified over all. Never such love, never such death. It was a desperate duel, but love bore the palm. What then, my heart? Hast thou no emotions excited within thee at the contemplation of such heavenly affection? Yes, my Lord, I long, I pant to feel thy love flaming like a furnace within me. Come thou thyself and excite the ardor of my spirit. And I tell you guys before, this love, our human bodies cannot take a full experience of this love. Our physical form can't handle it. It would, it would die. Our cells would implode. It, our body would die. It can't handle it. It's too powerful. We're given a new body in heaven so that we may experience that love full force, a love that permeates every cell of your fiber and being, a love that passes completely through you and saturates everything around you. It's a love that you cannot even begin to comprehend. For every drop of crimson blood thus shed to make me live, oh, wherefore, wherefore have not I a thousand lives to give? Why should I despair of loving Jesus with a love as strong as death? He deserves it. Amen, amen, amen. I desire it. The martyrs felt such love, and they were but flesh and blood. Then why not I? They mourned their weakness, and yet out of weakness were made strong. Grace gave them all their unflinching, unflinching constancy. There is the same grace for me. Jesus, lover of my soul, shed abroad such love, even thy love in my heart this evening. We don't understand this love because this love is beyond our understanding. Why would someone born of heaven has existed from eternity to eternity, had everything, needed nothing, decide to lay that down and be born as a human being. Well, he had all his faculties at his disposal. Believe you me, he could have turned the whole world upside down, and he did, in a way. But he was here for a different purpose. But to come down and be born as a human male, and to die as a human male, what love would cause a supreme being to do such things, to make such sacrifice? And he did that. In an ultimate act of humility, Jesus became not a spirit being anymore, but became a flesh being. He was still he was still of the spirit, but you understand he was born in the flesh, born into his creation, because the Bible says everything that was made was made with his hands. It wasn't made without, there was nothing made without his hands. He created, he knows us better than anyone. He knows us better than we know us. But what is remarkable is that he gave that position up there to come down here and in an ultimate act of humility be born as a male child to live a life to die 
for sinners and then to rise again, a more glorious position. If there was anything he lost in doing this, he gained a thousand times more back. Because the glory of what he did was he showed the ultimate act of love and that he literally gave up everything to gain even more. What a beautiful, beautiful love our Lord has for us. And can we love him back that much? Oh, scarcely. Scarcely. We don't have the capacity. However, there is something very interesting in that the suffering that we endure, the trials and tribulations we go through every day, <coughs> and if we are destined for martyrdom, and some are, some aren't, he will give us the ability to endure it with grace, with mercy, and with strength, and with boldness. And we glorify him in that. Because in that, we show the greatest level of love, whether we do it for him or do it for others. Funny enough, if I give my life for another, I'm still giving it for him because they are made in his image. So it's a win-win no matter what. What a love that is. What a love that is. And then we look and we see what's happening overseas. And so many people are looking at the negative. I'm looking at the positive. Because the Lord is awakening his people to the truth. The Lord is waking them up. Many are going to come to faith because of this. Many. In fact, this may be the final push to get the last of the family of God, the last of those marked out for the church, for the bride, in the door. We'll see. What's happening is quickly escalating, just like I kind of assumed it would. And it's going, I posted something on the community tab about that. It's going in the direction I thought it might go. Next few weeks will show us maybe a month if that maybe just a few days but the love of the Lord look at it. he still fights for his people who deny him Jesus Christ is fighting for Israel and they deny him for the most part not all for the most part two-thirds uh, will not be saved two uh, one-third will be saved as uh, Ezekiel says that's powerful stuff that, that the Lord is still working, still defending, still blessing his people, regardless of whether they accept him or not. Amazing. What a love to, to accept someone who hates him. We were all in that boat. We were all enemies until he came and called us. And we went to the Lord and he gave us salvation. He showed us grace and mercy, gave us grace and mercy, gave us faith, and made us to walk in his truth and his statutes and in his way. Changed us being born again to become the children of God. What a love. What a love. And to take what he earned and share it with us. What a love. That's our Lord. So this knowledge should cause us to be a little more forgiving to others. Be a little more amicable to others. Be a little more gracious to others. And to realize that whatever he did for us, we could never repay but a great way of going towards that direction is to be to others as he is to us. Show others love. You may have to be stern with them. You may have to be bold with them. You may even have to be a little rough with them. But it's still love that causes you to tell them the truth. It's still love that causes you to put yourself in between them and harm. It's love that causes you. It's love that caused all those Jewish military men to leave their families and to go fight. On no notice. And fighting, and they are fighting right now. It's love that sent me over to Iraq. It's love that brought you guys here looking for answers. It's love that causes us to bless each other in any way we can. It's love that brings all this together, that is bringing to fruition the culmination of human history in the prophecies written in this book. It was love that held him on the cross, not nails, love. They wouldn't have needed the nails. That was just a formality. And it was love that made the father bruise him. Love for us, love for him. And the Lord gave the father exactly what he wanted. And in the end, when we go, he's going to present us to the father and the father's going to present us back to him. What a day that's going to be to stand in the presence of God and Jesus Christ and the general assembly of heaven and to be party to this. Nay, take part in it. 
What an amazing thing to consider. And we're going to be there. So many people don't realize how real this book is and how real this is going to be. Many will be very pleasantly surprised when we get there and they realize, whoa, this is not what I pictured it. And it'll be better. Many aren't. They're sure going to wish they did. The Lord is going to show mercy to everybody all the way through. See, the tribulation, you keep in mind, the tribulation could be a one and done deal, but he's even going to offer salvation all the way through that seven years. And there will be people getting saved throughout that seven year period. Grace will still be shown. Well, that's love. A love you can't believe. And then there's going to be a thousand year millennial reign to iron out finer details and then a white throne judgment. What love the Father shows to extend such liberality of time to us to figure it out, to go out of his way to show us. That's our Lord. That's the love our Lord and our Father has for us. Let us reply with as much love as we can. And we do that not only in our prayers, but we do that in our interactions of other people. What a blessing. What a blessing to be called by his name and to have that kind of love dwelling within us. It's glorious. Stay strong, brothers and sisters. Stay focused on the truth. Stay reading the Bible. Keep watching what's going on. Be careful out there. Be wary. Be, be uh, attentive. Pay attention to things. Do what you know is right. Do what the Lord has told us to do. And watch all of this wrap up right before our eyes. And then the Lord comes and takes us up there. I found some other people the other day talking about the, there is no pre-tribulation rapture. I feel so bad for them. For the hateful ones, the Lord's going to deal with them. I have no, I have no compassion for them because they have gone out of their way to go hate others and attack others for that. Others that are supposed to be their brothers and sisters. But there are some who are, are just gentle, kind people that just, I guess the Lord hasn't given them to see it. I don't know. I feel, I feel bad for them. I have compassion for them that they don't have the joy of knowing this wonderful blessing that's coming, that they don't have the, the joy and the hope of looking forward to uh, the removal when the Lord comes for us. And they don't read Hebrews 9, 28. They don't read 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. They don't look closely at the scriptures. See, they're, they're terrified of it. They don't want it. Well, some don't want it. Well, to the ones who do see it, may the blessings of God be upon you in full force according to his will, to those who just can't see it, but they don't have any hatred towards any others. May the Lord open your eyes to the truth and to those who hate the others, well, may the Lord deal with you. Because his love rescues us from what's coming. And we're not marked out for that. There's no reason for us to go through that. That's not for us. That's for everyone else. I feel terrible for anybody who ends up finding themselves on the other side of the rapture. It is not going to be fun. It's not going to be nice. There's nothing cool or groovy or awesome about it. It is going to be a time of terror. I would wish they all would open their eyes and see the truth. But what can we do? But it is the love of the Lord to come and deliver his bride out of that. They keep forgetting the bride is a different group. The bride is a separate entity from everyone else. Not everyone is in the bride. But the Lord's coming for us. He said he would. And you go and you look at Hebrews 9.28, you have to figure out and explain why that, that is referring to three different appearances. Where's the second one? That verse specifically says he's coming for those eagerly waiting for him. He gives ownership of who he's coming for. So those who aren't eagerly waiting for him, I don't know what to tell them. I'm scared for them. It is what it is. But this is the love of our Lord. He's coming to take us home. And it may be some of them he takes too. I don't know. Maybe they're just in confusion. I don't know. I hope they get to come too. I would wish that we would all go. Everybody. Nobody would have to go through the tribulation. But there are evil forces on this earth that they are just hell-bent on destroying everything. No place for them. They don't have love in their heart. They don't have the love of Christ in their heart. They don't want it. Yeah. All we can do is live the truth and show them a living example. And pray the Lord blesses them with what he blessed us with tenfold. Peace, an open heart, and the love shed abroad in our heart, and joy inexpressible, and salvation. 
I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.